Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning into Exploring Reality, where you get to learn about the logical side of the Christian faith. Today, I have Joe Schmidt joining me, and we're going to talk about the modal ontological argument for God's existence. If you don't know Joe, he's a super smart guy. He's an agnostic philosopher, and I'm really excited about this. Stay tuned. Hello, Joe. How's it going, man? It's going well. I'm excited for this. I, I've been very excited for this for a while. Um, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody, uh, for those of you who don't know who you are, um, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, sweet. So uh, I'm Joe. I do both popular and scholarly level work in philosophy. So on the popular level, I have my YouTube channel called Majesty of Reason, where I have discussions with other philosophers, people like Rob Coons, Josh Rasmussen, Graham Oppie, all different sorts of people. And I also put, put out lecture videos of my own. And I also have a blog, Majesty of Reason, and a website now. It's a new website, josephschmid.com. It's got all my papers and, and everything. So um, yeah, check that out, whoever's interested. And then uh, yeah, on the scholarly level side, I just write um, uh, articles and books, things like that for like scholarly monographs and um, submit the articles to journals and so on. So yeah, that's me and uh, I'm excited for this. Awesome. So uh, before we get to like the meat of everything, um, do you have anything you want to say about the modal ontological arguments? I have actually haven't looked over the, obviously the presentation that you have. So is there anything that we need to, are, are there any like background, is there any background information we need to go over before we get into um, your presentation here? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I got some. I've got some background in the presentation itself. Awesome. So I figured like, you yes, did. <laughs> yes and no. So <laughs> my answer is both. Cool, cool. Well, I'll bring that up. I'll shut up, and then you can get going. Um, if I have questions, I'll let you know. Okay. Awesome. There you go, man. All right. So let me just. You can see me highlighting, right? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so the modal ontological argument. So here's an outline. People who know me know that I love my outlines. Here's an outline of what we're going to be doing. First, we're going to be understanding the modal ontological argument. We're going to look at modality, possible worlds, ontological, well, like what an ontological argument is. We're going to look at conceptions of God and so on. Basically, just laying the groundwork. And then we're just going to take a close look at one or two, pretty much just one specific symmetry breaker. And don't worry, I'll talk about what symmetry breakers are when we get there. So we're just going to look at one particular symmetry breaker. Okay, so that's the outline. Now let's go on to that first part, understanding the modal ontological argument. So the first concept that we need is modality. So modality concerns the study of possibility, necessity, contingency, and impossibility. 
Now, three kinds of possibility are going to concern us here. So first is a kind of logical possibility. Now, something is logically possible just in case its truth or existence doesn't involve or entail a strict logical contradiction of the form P and not P. So, um, you know, the cat is on the mat and it is not the case that the cat is on the mat. That would be logically impossible. Another thing that's arguably logically impossible is something like a square circle because, uh, well, to be a square is to have four sides and to be a circle is to have uh, well, what, do they have no sides? Maybe they have infinitely many sides. Maybe they have one side. Depends on how you define side. But uh, <laughs> so anyway, that those, those are logical impossibilities because they involve or entail a strict logical contradiction. And so really what logical possibility concerns is consistency of logical form. So it's kind of like the structure, the abstract structure of something. Whether or not its logical form can be shown to be or entail something of the form P and not P. So really, possibility, in terms of logical possibility, is like non-self-contradiction. There isn't a kind of contradiction there. Second, there is metaphysical possibility. So this is a second kind of possibility that, that we want to talk about. Now, something is metaphysically possible just in case it genuinely can exist or can be true. Reality could be such and such a way. Now, metaphysical possibility is, as I say right here, pretty difficult to define. It not only respects logical consistency, as in logical possibility, but it also has to respect the natures of things. So, for instance, there's nothing about logic itself, like the study of abstract rules of inference and uh, the forms of sentences. There's nothing about that that'll tell us what the nature of water is. But given that water has such and such a nature, like water is H2O or something along those lines, it's not going to be metaphysically possible for water to be something like H3O or HO or, you know, something along those lines or XYZ. And that's just because water is essentially H2O. Water is by nature H2O. What it is to be water is to be H2O, at least in part. And so uh, it's just not possible. It's not metaphysically possible for water to be anything other than H2O, despite the fact that there is no logical contradiction in that. So Metaphysical possibility is a little bit more demanding than logical possibility because not only do you have to respect logical consistency, which is what logical possibility does, like concerns with, but you also have to respect the natures of things, as I was saying. Now, there are different accounts of metaphysical possibility. So these are just trying to pinpoint, hey, what is it in reality in virtue of which things are metaphysically possible? So you have, for instance, Aristotelian powers-based accounts or what, what are sometimes called branching actualist theories. These say that something is metaphysically possible just in case it's either actual or something that is actual has the causal power to initiate a causal chain leading up to that thing. There's also Lewisian modal realism. So something would be possible just in case it like really exists in a concrete, concretely existent spatiotemporal manifold. You have platonic accounts where something is possible just in case it's it's within or entailed by a maximal consistent collection of, of propositions, something along those lines. So anyway, we don't need to concern ourselves with these specific accounts. We just need to know what metaphysical possibility is. And then finally, the third kind of possibility that's going to concern us here is epistemic possibility. Now, something is epistemically possible for someone just in case it is consistent with what they know. So you can think of it as something's epistemically possible for me if for all I know, it might be true, right? So for all I know right now, it might be raining, like it could be raining in Moscow. That's a possibility. I mean, it's, it's either one way or the other. And if I were in Moscow, um, one of them, if I was looking outside, one of them actually wouldn't be epistemically possible for me because I just, I'd see it, right? I just know that it's not raining, say. Um, but given that I don't know that, it's kind of open either way for all I know. So this epistemic possibility has to do with our knowledge and our justification and our beliefs and things like that. So whereas metaphysical and logical possibility are concerning things about reality, epistemic possibility concerns like our mental and psychological states. Like it's consistent with what we know. Now, here are some cases to test our comprehension of these three concepts and to kind of show where they can come apart. So Goldbach's conjecture. So Goldbach's conjecture is this thesis in mathematics. And it says that every even number greater than two is such that it is equal to the sum of two primes. So for instance, take uh, what, 26? That's the sum of two primes, namely seven and 19. Um, or take what, 14? That's the sum of two primes, namely uh, 11 and three, and so on. So philosophers, not philosophers, mathematicians have tested this for like tons and tons of cases, just individual cases, but we don't have a proof of it yet. And in mathematics, we really only have mathematical knowledge if we're able to demonstrate it, we're able to prove it. And so Goldbach's conjecture 
for all we know, for all mathematicians know, and for all humanity knows right now, because we don't have a proof of it, it's epistemically possible that it's true, and it's also epistemically possible that it's false. But because it's it's like a it's part of mathematics, right? It's not as though reality could like contingently happen to be the case that uh, some even numbers are such that they can be. Um, you can add together two primes to get them. It's not as though that's like a contingent fact about reality. No, these are like mathematical facts, like mathematical facts, like one plus one equals two. And, you know, all these addition and arithmetical operations, these are necessary facts. These are metaphysically necessary facts. And so this is a case where we have metaphysical possibility coming apart from epistemic possibility, because both the truth and falsity of Goldbach's conjecture are epistemically possible, but only one of those is metaphysically possible. It's either metaphysically necessary that it's true, or else it's metaphysically necessary that it's false. Similarly with the billionth digit of pi. So I think we have like upwards of 62 or 64 trillion digits of pi known to us right now. Um, that was, I think that's the latest estimate that I looked at. <laughs> I Googled that right beforehand so I could, I could get that down. And so, so humanity, a lot, some people know the billionth digit of pi, so it's stored somewhere, but I don't. And I, pro probably the audience doesn't either. And so, you know, it could be a four, it could be a five, it could be a six. For all I know, those might be true. So it's an epistemic possibility. But again, it's it's not metaphysically possible because pi, obviously, it's, you know, it, it, what it is to be pi is to have that specific line of digits. And so um, it, this also highlights that epistemic possibility is really agent. It's, it's agent relative. It depends on what an individual person, what their epistemic status is because some other person might know the billionth digit of pi, whereas I don't. Here's another one, whether it's raining in Moscow, right? So presumably this is actually a contingent fact. It could have, in, in terms of metaphysical possibility, it could have been the case that it's raining in Moscow, but it also could have been the case that it's not raining in Moscow. Now, of course, one or the other is in fact true, but presumably this is a contingent fact about reality. But I don't know either way. And so either one is epistemically possible, either one is metaphysically possible, and of course, either one is logically possible whether I exist. So this is a case where the denial of this, I exist, denying that is not epistemically possible for me because I know that I exist. I'm like absolutely certain in that. And so its falsity is not epistemically possible. This is an epistemically necessary claim, but it's not metaphysically necessary, right? I am not a necessary being. Uh, <laughs> I could have failed to exist if my parents hadn't met today. So that's another case where epistemic possibility and metaphysical possibility can kind of come apart, in particular, the, the necessity. Now, water is H2O. Now, this is a case where it's, I, I mean, I know that it's epistemically necessary. It's also metaphysically necessary, but it's not logically necessary because there's nothing contradictory by saying that water is not H2O. There, there's just no little strict logical contradiction to that. We had to kind of discover the nature or essence of, of water. And then finally, nothing causes itself to come into being. This is arguably a metaphysical necessity, right? I mean, in order to cause itself to come into existence, it would already have to be there. And so it's not as though it's bringing itself into being. And, but nevertheless, this is not logically impossible. We have to know something about the nature of causation. We have to analyze what it is to cause something. And then we have to base our knowledge of that nothing can cause itself to come into existence on that. So it's not as though you can kind of get a, a strict logical abstract, you know, logical demonstration of, of the impossibility of this. You have to bring in claims about the nature of causation. And that is going to put it in the, into the realm of metaphysical possibility and necessity. Okay, so those are some comprehension cases. And finally, I'm just going to say that metaphysical uh, possibility, that's the most important for the modal ontological argument. We're really concerned with metaphysical possibility. So that's, uh, that's the first thing, modality uh, of background that, that we need to have in our pockets. On to the second one, which is possible worlds. Now, as philosophers talk about possible worlds, they're really just heuristic devices without any kind of ontological import. And what I mean by that is that philosophers aren't trying to like, I mean, some of them are, but not necessarily whenever they talk about possible worlds. They're not trying to commit to the robust reality of possible worlds. Like, oh, there, there is some alternative dimension out there, alternative world out there. No, we're not ontologically committing to them, saying that there really are such things. We're just using them as a kind of heuristic device. We're using them as a tool to talk and to talk about modality and to make modal statements easier and more comprehensible. But so then what we mean by a possible world then is a total or complete or global or comprehensive or maximal way that reality could be. So the actual world, the total history, everything that happens, everything that's really true, that is a possible world. Another possible world is where 
let's say 10 minutes ago, I sneezed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's like one of the only minor differences than the way that reality actually went. And so that's like a different possible world because it has a different set of truths. In, one, in that world, I actually sneezed like 10 minutes ago, say. So, and again, it would be the total or global or complete way that reality be. So there would be a lot of overlap with this world. It would share a lot of that history, but it would still be a different possible world because, well, I sneezed in that one. Okay, so those are possible worlds. Just think of it as a total way that reality could be. Reality genuinely could be that way. And these are metaphysically possible worlds. So again, we're really going to be talking about metaphysical possibility from now on, unless specified otherwise. So think of possible worlds as metaphysically possible worlds. So presumably there's a possible world where evolution went slightly differently. There's a possible world where I don't exist. There's a possible world where I exist. <laughs> the actual world is an instance of that. And so on. Okay, the third thing that I want to say is what is an ontological argument? So an ontological argument is, roughly speaking, an armchair a priori argument for God's existence. A priori, people pronounce that differently. Some people say a priori. So it doesn't really matter. So what that means is that the premises are justified independently of our experience of the empirical world. So you can kind of know them from your armchair, as it were. You can kind of reflect on things, and you can just see the certain steps and see them to be true. Now, ontological arguments are based on, among other things, reflections on God's nature and or reflections on the nature of existence or perfection or modality and or the concepts of God or existence or perfection or modality. So ontological arguments are really just looking at either the natures of things or our concepts of things. And usually it's very abstract things like existence and perfection and modality and so on. Okay, so that's the third preliminary that I want to cover. The fourth preliminary that I want to cover is God. So what do we mean by God in this context? Because we're talking about a modal ontological argument for God's existence. So of course we need to know what the heck we're talking about when we say God. So God, as I use it here, is just a necessarily existent, perfect, unlimited, concrete foundation of reality. So God is perfect and unlimited. What I mean by that is, well, a whole host of things. These are just really trying to get you guys to understand what I mean by perfect and unlimited. So he's like axiologically supreme. So axiology, that's just like the study of value. So he is supreme in value, unlimited in value. He's the greatest possible being. He's perfect and unlimited in knowledge and power and goodness and all other perfections that, that a being could have, qua a being. He's also necessarily existent. So again, metaphysical necessity. He exists in all possible worlds. What that, that's what it means to necessarily exist. He cannot fail to exist. He must exist. And of course, uh, I'm, not, I'm not just trying to assert God's existence. I'm saying, I'm saying this is part of the definition of God. If God exists, well, then he's a necessary being. So that, that's what we mean by necessarily existent. It's something that if it exists in any world, it exists in all possible worlds. It cannot fail to exist. It must exist. God is also concrete. And what I mean by that is just God is causally capable. He has causal powers. He's not like a non-causal abstract object, like the number two or like the set containing the natural numbers. He's also the foundation of reality. What that means is that God is the ultimate independent being upon which every other being depends. Okay, so that's what I mean by God. And then another preliminary, system S5. That's, what's, that's a system of modal logic that we're going to be using in uh, the modal ontological argument. This is a system of modal logic made up of first foundational axioms and second rules of inference. So in rules that allow you to go from certain statements to other statements, like what validly follows from what. And it's a system of modal logic. So again, remember modality is a study of possibility, necessity, contingency, and impossibility. And logic is really just the study of valid inference. So it's valid inferences concerning possibility, necessity, and so on. And so there are certain foundational axioms and rules of inference in systems of modal logic, and there are different systems. Now, the most popular standard system of modal logic is indeed system S5. And it's meant to capture, again, metaphysical modality. Of course, it's a logical system, but what the logical system is helping us to capture or represent is indeed metaphysical modality. So we're using the logical tools to help us formalize and uh, you know, make certain systematic rules of inference and foundational axioms, we're helping to systemize what we really think is metaphysically possible. So the characteristic axiom of S5, so each, each system of modal logic oftentimes incorporates the elements of the, the systems that kind of precede it. So S5 incorporates a lot of the stuff in the other, in the other uh, systems. They inc include their axioms. And a lot of these axioms are pretty simple things. Like one of them is called the distribution axiom. So that's like if P entails Q, so if it's necessarily the case that if P, then Q. 
and also if it's necessarily the case that P, well, then it's also necessarily the case that Q, right? If P strictly entails Q and P obtains in all possible worlds, well, then of course Q is likewise going to obtain in all possible worlds because P strictly entails Q. You can't have P without Q. So that, that's like a, that's an example of, of like a, an axiom. So the characteristic axiom of S5, so this is really what, what makes S5 distinctive. Uh, it's that it says that whatever is possible is necessarily possible. So it's not like possibilities vary from possible world to possible world. Rather, if something's possible, well, then it must be possible. It's not like something it could be possible and yet, oh, well, it might be possible in some other possible world. No, whatever is possible is invariant across all possible worlds. Whatever is possible must be possible. Whatever is possible is necessarily possible. Now, this actually entails that whatever is possibly necessary is just necessary simpliciter. So whatever could be necessarily existent is just necessarily existent. So if you can establish that something is possibly necessary, if it's possibly necessarily true or possibly necessarily existent, it just follows that it's necessarily existent or necessarily true. So, oops, zooming in. <laughs> Here is the intuitive idea of S5. So imagine that this is the space of all possible worlds. Now, of course, the space of all possible worlds doesn't have uh, 30, presumably. Presumably, it's many, 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 many more than 30. But this is, this is just a, a representation for uh, pedagogical purposes, of course. So imagine that this is the space of all possible worlds. Here's the, the actual world. I have a little at that stands for, you guessed it, actual. So that's the actual world. And these are all the other possible worlds. So maybe, you know, this is the one where I sneeze. It's a pretty nearby possible world. Maybe in this one way over here, evolution went way differently. Maybe um, the asteroid not only killed off all the dinosaurs, but like all life on Earth or something like that. Anyway, this is just the, the total space of possible worlds. Maybe in this one, there is no Earth, uh, you know, that just it's a barren universe. It doesn't matter. This is just the abstract. This is an abstract representation of all possible worlds. And here's the actual world. Now, suppose that... It's possible. So we're, we're making claims in the actual world. So we're kind of, we're located here. And we're saying from here, from our perspective here, it's possible that there's a necessary being, or it's possibly necessary that something is the case. Well, imagine that that necessary thing, we'll just pretend that it's a being, but it could also be a truth. So let's just imagine that that's this little check. So that just means that, hey, there's a, necess there's a necessary being in that world, okay? So what we say here is that, we're, from our perspective in this little actual world, we say it's possible that there's a necessary being. So we're saying, hey, there's some possible world in which there is a necessary being. So that's what this represents. There's some possible world in which there's a necessary being. But wait, to be a necessary being, what it is to be necessary, right, is to exist in all possible worlds. That's what it is to be necessary. That's what philosophers mean when we're talking about something that's necessary. By contrast, something that's contingent exists in some, but not all possible worlds. Something that's necessary exists in all possible worlds. And so if there's a necessary thing in this world, well, it couldn't be necessary in this world unless it existed in all possible worlds, right? That's what it is to be necessary. And so it couldn't even obtain in this world if it didn't also obtain in all the other worlds. And so it takes us to this, this situation here. So we say from this perspective, it's at least possible that there's a necessary thing, but then we can actually go from that to the necessary being spanning all the worlds because the being couldn't even be necessary in this world if it didn't span all the worlds. And hence, since it is necessary in this world, it's possibly necessary. It follows that there's a necessary being in all worlds, which is just to say that it's, it's necessary. It's necessary simpliciter. And of course, it's actual. It's in the actual world as well. So again, that's just the intuitive idea behind S5. It's to help you guys get the intuitive idea of what we're saying when we say that whatever is possibly necessary is necessary simpliciter. Now, we should note, of course, that um, S5, despite being standard and popular, it's not altogether uncontroversial. So there are um, philosophical criticisms of it, and uh, it should not be just taken for granted. Um, but for our purposes here, we're not going to look into all the specific details. Um, we're just going to assume it for the, the purposes of the presentation. But if anyone wants to you know, build a, a case for God on it, they need to be aware that it's not altogether uncontroversial. Um, for a recent defense of System S5 um, as a, a formal capturing of metaphysical possibility and necessity, you can see Proust and Rasmussen's book, Necessary Existence, their second chapter. OK, so that's, that's System S5. And now another preliminary, which is the argument itself. So we have finally gotten onto the argument. Um, and yeah, here is the modal ontological argument. Drum roll. No, OK. So here is the possibility premise. It's just got one premise, people. So you can. it's easy to remember. Here's the possibility premise. Possibly, God exists. 
okay? Remember, this is metaphysical possibility. We are not just saying here that, oh, for all I know, God might exist or, you know, things like that. And we're also not just saying, oh, well, it's at least consistent. It's consistent to suppose that God exists. It's not, there isn't some kind of logical contradiction in the statement, God exists. It's not something like the cat is on the mat and it is not the case that the cat is on the mat. We're not making those sorts of claims. What we're claiming here is that it's metaphysically possible that God exists. And what that means, of course, given what I said earlier, is that there is some possible world, at least one possible world, wherein God does in fact exist in that world. So that's a possibility premise. And then from that, it follows that God exists, okay? It follows that God exists from, number one, the possibility premise, so possibly God exists, two, as five, and three, the definition of God. So remember the definition of God, right? God is a necessary being. And given as five, whatever is possibly necessary is just necessary. And here we say that possibly God, a necessary being, exists. So there's possibly a necessary being, in which case there is a necessary being. And, uh, of course, by that, the necessary being that we're talking about here is God, and hence God exists. So that is the argument. There's one premise, possibly God exists, and the conclusion follows from that possibility premise, from S5, and from the definition of God. So that's the argument. Bada bing, bada boom. God proven. We can, we can quit. We're done. We can leave. Um, no. Uh, so here's the, here's the first problem that uh, some philosophers or some people might think that to level towards this. So um, like, again, just to situate the audience, I went through a bunch of different preliminaries about the nature of God, about modality, uh, distinguishing the different kinds of possibility. Now I just gave the argument. And now we're going to look at some, some problems that people have leveled towards the argument before we get to the most quote unquote devastating problem, which is the symmetry problem. So the first problem that we're going to consider is not the symmetry problem. Instead, it's actually just going to attack that possibility premise head on. It's basically going to say, no, uh, either that possibility premise is false. So it's either going to positively say that it's false or so that would be a rebutting defeater. You're trying to give reasons to think that it's not true, that it's actually false. Or you could just give a kind of undercutting defeater, which is just saying, hey, that premise is not adequately supported. It's not adequately justified. So those are the two types of defeater that one might level towards this first premise. Uh, at least two types of defeater. But uh, what we're going to focus on here, and I'm just going to be brief, is just attacking it by means of rebutting defeaters. So some people might try to attack that first premise through incoherence arguments. So they might say, hey, God, we know that God is actually impossible. God is not possible. God is, is not a possible being. He's metaphysically impossible. It's not possible that God exists. So how might people argue for that? Well, they might argue for um, argue for that using incoherence arguments. This is just my term. So there are single property incoherence arguments. You know, people might say, oh, there are certain paradoxes on omnipotence. Uh, can God heat a burrito that's so hot that even God can't eat it? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, debunked. No. Um, we oh, also no. Have, <laughs> I know. Uh, we have uh, paradoxes of omniscience. So uh, these are really interesting, and a bunch of different philosophers have written on them. So you have, like, Cantorian paradoxes. So you might think that, hey, if God knows, if God's omniscient, well, then he knows all the truths. And if he knows all the truths, well, then there's a collection of all the truths. But if there's a collection of all the truths, um, well, that doesn't make any sense because you can just, um, you can't form all the truths into a collection given uh, what's called Cantor's theorem. Um, you, you can actually form the power set or power collection of that collection, and you'll actually entail that there are more truths than there are truths, which is absurd. And so there can't be such a collection, in which case there can't be an omniscient being, yada, yada, yada. I'm not trying to defend these arguments, people. I am not. I'm just making you guys aware of them. You also have Russellian or self-reference paradoxes. So you might think that if God is... Um, if God's omniscient, well, then he's going to have to know all of his acts of knowledge that are not about themselves, right? So some of God's acts of knowledge, like knowing that I exist, is not about God's own act of knowledge. But other of God's act of, acts of knowledge, um, like that he knows things, that's going to be a self-referential act of knowledge. So it's directed towards itself. It's about itself. But if that's the case, well, then it would seem as though um, we can focus on all of God's acts of knowledge that are all and only those acts of knowledge that are not about themselves that are non-self-referring. Uh, well, then we can ask: Does God know that? Know that? Does he? Is he aware of that? Does he have an act of knowledge that knows all and only of those? Well, if he's omniscient, he has to. It's not as though he's ignorant or, or unaware of it. But then we can ask: Of that act of knowledge, is it about itself or is it not? If it's about itself, well, then it's included in that collection. But included in that collection is only things that only acts of knowledge that aren't about themselves. So you get a contradiction. But if it, if it is about, if it's not about itself, well, then it actually is about itself because it includes all the things that aren't about themselves. So anyway, that's really complicated. You don't need to worry about it. We're not going to be pursuing these in depth here. I just want to put these on your radar. 
there are also paradoxes of perfect rationality. You might think that um, there's an infinitely ascending chain of greater and greater possible worlds, uh, in which case it's hard to see how a rational being could be, could satisfy, could choose one where, could, could choose to actualize a world when there are infinitely many greater worlds than that. Uh, it's, you know, that would seem to be somewhat irrational. And so it's hard to see that there could be a perfectly rational being if that's the case. Again, I'm not defending these. I'm not taking a stance on these. There are responses to these in the literature. There are counter responses and so on. I'm just trying to give you guys a lay of the land of how people might push back on that first premise. So those are single property and coherence arguments. They focus on one property that God is alleged to have. There are also multiple property and coherence arguments. So you might, people might think that moral perfection conflicts with divine freedom. You know, if God's morally perfect, he can't sin. But if he can't sin, well, then it seems as though he's not free with respect to that. Uh, and so he's not perfectly free. You might think that. Um, you might think that, um, you know, presumably if God's praiseworthy, well, then he's going to have to be morally praiseworthy. But he can't be morally praiseworthy because he couldn't, you know, he couldn't do anything evil, so his, his character isn't really up to him in that sense. He just kind of has a built-in or necessary character, and so he doesn't really have any ultimate responsibility as to how his character is, and so it's hard to see how he could be morally praiseworthy for that. Um, you might think that. You might think, oh, well, if God's omniscient, well, then um, he's going to know his own actions in advance, in which case, how, does, how is he free with respect to those actions? They're kind of already settled. You know, anyway, I'm not here to defend these again. Uh, I'm just giving you guys a lay of the land as to how people might attack that possibility premise. And then finally, there are God world incoherence arguments. So there, you know, we were just focusing on single property ones, multiple property ones, and then God world ones. So some people mount some versions of the logical problem of evil. Um, I really don't like the logical problem of evil, but we can set that aside. Uh, there are some versions of divine hiddenness where they're like more logical type um, versions. Also some, some versions of religious disagreement arguments and some arguments from imperfection and so on. Okay, so that's one way that people might attack that um, possibility premise. Now, how do, how do people respond to these? Well, one could either respond to these incoherence arguments directly, or one could actually take uh, philosopher Yuji Nagasawa's approach, which is called a maximal God approach. So this approach avoids incoherence arguments by simply defining God as the being with the maximally greatest compossible collection of great making features that don't contradict either themselves or, or features of the world. So... Um, in this way, you secure that God is the greatest possible being because he's the being with the maximally greatest possible collection of great making features. And also you avoid the coherence arguments by definition. Like, okay, if you think full-blown omniscience is, is impossible, well, we can just say he knows however many things is, is you know, the, the best possible thing, the best possible way for something to know things. Uh, the best, the best amount, say, the best kind of knowledge, and so on. So even if it's not fully blown, maxed out, um, what you do is you just define God as the being with the maximally greatest possible collection. Um, so that's that's a way to avoid the incoherence arguments, and it also guarantees God's possibility. Now, there are a few worries uh, with this approach. Uh, we won't really dwell on these, and uh, I'm not going to give some, I'm not going to give exhaustive or totally representative worries for uh, Nagasawa's maximal God approach. So Firstly, there might be no unique maximal collection. I mean, consider, right? So let's just simplify our analysis here by supposing that there are three perfections that God will have. Knowledge, power, and goodness. So knowledge level, power level, and goodness level. And suppose they max out at 10. So we're just that's just an abstract unit. So they max out at 10. Now, we're supposing, let's just suppose that, you know, uh, we can't get all of them maxing out together. So we go with Nagasawa's approach, which is that it's just the greatest possible collection. Well, there might not be any unique maximal collection. What if we have a case where 1099 versus 9109 versus 9910, right? For knowledge level, power level, and goodness level. Um, it's unclear how, why, why would one of these be privileged over the others? And if there's no unique maximal collection, well, like, which one is God going to have? Like, it would seem to be utterly arbitrary and inexplicable for God to have one of these as opposed to the other one, given that there uh, might be no unique maximal collection. Secondly, there might be no maximal collection. So this is a this is a uniqueness problem. There might be no maximal collection. So perhaps 10, 10, 10 is impossible, but anything less is possible. Well, then there's no maximal that is greatest possible collection, right? You could have 9.99999, but you can also have 9.9999999, and you could have, you know, so and so on and so on. So um, you could always have a greater a, a, a better maximal collection, as it were. So that's the second problem um, there. You know, that might be the case. A uh, third thing is that the being might not be godlike at all. I mean, it might simply be like a superhuman or super alien type thing. I mean, uh, if we're saying that 
a lot of these different imperfections might be impossible after all, and we just have to go with the greatest compossible collection. Well, I mean, why think that that thing would be anything near God? Maybe it's just like this super intelligence. Like, again, it doesn't even, you know, why think that modal space is populated with something that is sufficiently godlike? Once we, once we get rid of this requirement of maxed out power, maxed out knowledge, maxed out goodness, and so on. Also, why would we think that necessary existence will be in that collection? I mean, that, of course, that's crucial, right, for S5 to be applicable in this case. Um, but maybe the greatest compossible collection of great-making features is just something that's contingent, that has a lot of really good knowledge and power and so on. So anyway, there, there, there are more difficulties and there are responses to these. I'm just trying to give you guys um, a lay of the land with respect to Nagasawa's maximal god approach. So um, the second problem, and this is the more quote-unquote devastating problem, um, for the modal ontological argument. So the first problem, we're just looking at attacking the first, uh, attacking the possibility premise. And then the second problem is the symmetry problem. So this shows that there is a reverse modal ontological argument with a possibility premise and a conclusion contradicting the modal ontological argument. And crucially, that possibility premise seems to be on epistemic par, as it were, with the original possibility premise of the modal ontological argument. There doesn't seem to be any reason one could privilege one or over the other absent some further considerations, in which case we're kind of at a stalemate, in which case the modal ontological argument uh, by itself doesn't work. You're gonna have to give some other additional argument. So there's this symmetry problem, right? And here is that symmetrical reverse modal ontological argument with a reverse possibility premise. Possibly God doesn't exist, right? It's saying it's metaphysically possible that God doesn't exist. There's some possible world in which God doesn't exist. And from that, you can conclude that, uh, oh, why did I say that God, <laughs> God doesn't? Here we go. See, this is what's nice about doing this when you like don't have a PDF or something. So, and the reverse conclusion is that God doesn't exist, right? Because um, God is a necessary being. And so if he exists in one world, well, then he exists in all of them. And so if you're saying that he possibly doesn't exist in one of them, well, then it follows that he exists in none of them. So this is, this is a pretty serious problem. Because without adducing any further considerations or reasons, the reverse possibility premise is epistemically on par with the original possibility premise. It would be intolerably ad hoc to privilege one over the other without some additional reason. It'd just be utterly arbitrary. There is no reason to do it. It would be irrational. And thus, a principled non-question begging reason, a symmetry breaker, would be needed for such differential epistemic treatment. If you want to privilege one of these possibility premises over the other, if you want to affirm one or the other or think one is more plausible, you're gonna need some kind of principled additional non-question begging reason, a symmetry breaker that kind of breaks that epistemic symmetry between them. Absent such a reason, however, the epistemic force of MOA, the modal ontological argument and the reverse MOA, they cancel one another out, in which case the modal ontological argument fails as an argument for God's existence. So now this brings philosophers into the prospect of breaking symmetry, right? This is where the debate is really going on uh, in the philosophical literature. So there are many different proposals from many different authors. Proust, for instance, one of his papers, he appeals to mystical experience in conjunction with the principle that whatever seems or appears to be the case is metaphysically possible. This is one that I'm going to be examining in, in later on in this. Um, Proust also, in one of his 2010 papers, he appeals to theism's motivational centrality to the flourishing lives of individuals and communities. We already covered Nagasawa's maximal compossible approach. Rasmussen, for instance, appeals to degrees of greatness, and he argues that the possibility, given that some degrees of greatness are possible, that gives us defeasible reason for thinking that all degrees of greatness, including maximal greatness, are possible. Um, what is that? Buras? Uh, no, I, I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, Buras and Cantrell, they appeal to desire. Um, uh, the tragically deceased Ben Arbor, he appeals to open-mindedness. Mac, uh, Chad McIntosh appeals to a modalized principle phenomenal conservatism. In one of my papers under review, I appeal to uh, a defeasible principle possible explanation. Um, you can, for people who are interested in that, they can see my discussion on capturing Christianity with Alex O'Connor or Cosmic Skeptic. It's right here. Uh, these are not real images of us. <laughs> these, uh, these I are love them. <laughs> yes, these are edited images. They are edited to make us look younger. That's why it says two baby philosophers discuss the ontological argument. Yeah, that got a lot of views, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. But uh, that was super fun. It was such a fun convo. Um, and then still other authors argue for the possibility. Possibility. Okay, nice. Still other authors argue for the possibility of gratuitous evil, for instance, and hence the possibility of God's non-existence, right? So if you could just, a lot of philosophers think that if there's gratuitous evil, that is evil that serves absolutely no purpose, it doesn't serve any greater good, well, then God wouldn't allow that, right? God has to have some reason for permitting the evils that he does. So if it's possible, if it's possible that there's a gratuitous evil, well, then it's possible that God doesn't exist, given at least given that God would prevent gratuitous evil. 
And so, you know, some people try to give reverse symmetry breakers. And so that, that's one way that some people try to give a reverse symmetry breaker. Now, um, so yeah, that's the prospect of, of symmetry breaking. Now we need to be wary, right? Because there are two problems that afflict lots of proposed symmetry breakers. One of them is relocating the symmetry. And that's a big problem. So for instance, one might say, oh, well, I can conceive of God's existence or, oh, it's coherent to suppose that God exists. Yes, but it's also conceivable that God doesn't exist. I mean, um, it's not as though naturalism or, you know, a sufficiently robust version of naturalism that um, really sophisticated thinkers like Graham Oppie, Felipe Leon, Paul Draper, and so on, uh, J.L. Schellenberg, it's not like those are, um, you know, conceptually confused, or, you know, conceptually incoherent. Uh, they're, uh, they're at least conceivable. I mean, Argue, even to argue against them, it seems you'd have to be able to conceive of them. So yeah, those are conceivable. Those are arguably coherent as well. Uh, so I don't think that you're going to be able to give conceivability and coherence type symmetry breakers. And a lot of the other symmetry breakers might, might, folk, uh, might face this problem of relocating the symmetry. So we need to be wary. And this is just tools for everyone. Whenever you are confronted with a potential symmetry breaker, ask, does this actually just push the buck back a step? Does it relocate the symmetry rather than resolve it? So that's one thing that we need to be wary about. Another thing that we need to be wary about is mitigated modal skepticism. So that this is at least a cause for caution. So modal skepticism is just um, skeptic, being skeptical, suspending judgment about a lot of our claims to knowledge of far out possibilities and far out like possibility, like possibility claims far out from our everyday experience. So, um, you know, we might initially think, oh, uh, you know, it's possible that an iron bar could float on water. I mean, I can imagine that. I can conceive of it. I can flesh out the scenario in my mind. It's coherent. You might think that, but that's actually not possible. If you study like what it is to be iron, given its uh, chemical composition, given its uh, the way that its protons are structured and so on, it actually has a density which disallows it from floating on water, which in turn has a particular density fixed by its essence or nature. And so given that, it's actually not possible for iron, for an iron bar to float on water. And so we just, we need to be cautious. We need to be cautious given that our modal knowledge arguably is highly fallible and people like Felipe Leon and Peter Vennenwagen and others have actually pushed, pushed for great caution in this regard. Uh, by their mitigated modal skepticism. So we just need to be careful. We need to be cautious. Um, so yeah, people who are in, I'm not going to go into this further um, and I'm not going to spell out mitigated modal skepticism, the arguments for it and against it and so on, but we just need to be careful. Yeah. I like, I like Dr. Rasmussen's little orange safety cones analogy here yeah. in his book, in his book uh, with Philippe Leon. Um, so yeah, I, I like that. Yeah, that is, that is an excellent point. And people like, yeah, that, that's, that's precisely where these sorts of things come up because Josh was talking about certain possibility claims, like it's possible that contingent things are explained, you know, things like that. And so given that potentially we're making possibility claims, you know, pretty removed from our ordinary humdrum experience, uh, we just need to be, we need to exercise a level of caution. Yep. And so that, that's an excellent uh, connection there between uh, what Josh was on your channel. I enjoyed that one. So just for the audience. Okay, so I'll be focusing on Proust's onto mystical symmetry breaker and um, probably only have, you know, 10, 15 minutes, uh, 15 minutes left of my presentation to go, um, something like that. Uh, Proust appeals to mystical experiences as of a maximally great being in conjunction with what's known as the Samkara principle to justify the possibility premise of the modal ontological argument and thereby break the symmetry between the MOA and reverse MOA. Now, I don't think his particular symmetry breaker works and so my thesis is that it fails for three reasons. And I'll explain his symmetry breaker in a little bit more detail below. Now, again, this is just my thesis. I argue that it merely relocates rather than resolves the symmetric reverse modal ontological argument problem. And I also argue that it faces counterexamples from uh, what mystics themselves in the great mystical traditions and so on, like for instance, St. Teresa of Avila, or of St. Teresa of Avila, or if you want to pronounce it, like it's probably pronounced way back when she lived, uh, Teresa of Avila, that's probably what it is, something like that. Um, now, I'm going to argue that it faces counterexamples from the reported phenomenology, the, the what it is likeness, the aspects of their experiences that the mystics themselves describe. Okay. Oh, and thirdly, I'm going to argue that it mistakenly attributes a high degree of ramification to mystical experiences. And I'll, I'll define what ramification is later. So now let's take a closer look at Proust's onto mystical symmetry breaker. So he begins by appealing to the Samkara principle or SP, 
according to which whatever seems or appears to be the case in experience is at least metaphysically possible. More formally, for any X and any S, if subject S has an experience as of X, so for instance, as of an apple, well then X is possible, that apple is possible. Now, Proust introduces the technical term really seems, and he consequently settles on a formulation of SP that states uh, whatever really seems to a subject could be, where an X really seems to S is true if and only if S would be correctly identifying the content of a single phenomenal experience of hers if she were to, <laughs> excuse me, if she were identifying it to be an X. But that's too complicated, and we need not concern ourselves here with the more technical version of the principle, since my criticisms apply regardless of which version is used. That's crucial. I'm not just setting it aside because it's complicated. Um, I'm I'm setting it aside because it's needlessly complicated, given that my criticisms are going to apply regardless of which version is used. And so people want to understand this uh, principle further. They can firstly uh, read his paper. Uh, and secondly, they can uh, just pause this video and read what I'm highlighting right now. But anyway, back to back up here. So uh, again, more formally, this is the SP, some car principle. If, if subject S has an experience as of X, then X is possible. But there is reason to believe, writes Proust, that some of the high mystics had an experience as of a maximally great being. If SP were true, it would follow that it is possible that there is a maximally great being, right? Because if a subject S has an experience as of S, then it's possible. But mystics have an experience as of a maximally great being. Hence, a maximally great being is possible. And that's really just the perfect being that I was talking about earlier, God's being perfect. Uh, and, and this is the conception of God that we're working with. So God's a necessary being. And so it would follow by S5 that God exists. And so we have a symmetry breaker here. Now, Proust motivates SP in a variety of ways. Uh, but my criticisms of Proust's symmetry breaker are independent of the motivations proffered on SP's behalf. And so for present purposes, uh, that above characterization of Proust's approach will suffice. And so I'm going to turn now to my next, uh, to my first criticism. Okay, so I'm going to argue that it relocates the symmetry. So Proust aims to resolve the symmetry problem by means of his symmetry breaker. But arguably, he merely relocates rather than resolves the symmetry problem. For plausibly, atheists have powerful experiences in which it appears or seems that God or something near enough does not exist. Or if they don't experience God's absence, at least they seem to have powerful experiences of things that, if true or existent, would entail the non-existence of God. An example of this would be an experience of the sheer indifference and or callousness of ultimate reality to one's flourishing language. For if God exists, then of course ultimate reality is not so indifferent. Uh, God is not indifferent to the flourishing languishing of um, of humans, say. So as Draper writes, uh, sen so this is one in one of his 1989 papers, sensitive theists also feel inclined in other circumstances, namely when they experience poignant evil, to believe that the creator is indifferent to their good or to the good of others. And many atheists have very powerful experiences in which they seem to be aware of the ultimate indifference of nature. By SP, again, I'm just using Proust's own principle, by SP, if S has an experience as of reality's ultimate indifference, well, then reality's ultimate indifference is possible. And plausibly, many people have had such experiences. Hence, it is possible that real, uh, we, uh, why, why should we think this? Why should we think that many people have had such experiences? Well, firstly, I mean, the, the phenomenological reports of many people who are uh, either deconverting from religion or who have experienced such profound and horrendous evils in their lives or, uh, and, and so on. So it's just using the same sort of phenomenological reports that Proust himself relies on in his Samkara principle and application to um, mystics, uh, mystical experience. So again, plausibly, people have had such an experience. And hence, it is possible by SP that reality is ultimately indifferent. But of course, any world in which reality is ultimately indifferent is a world in which God, understood as a maximally great being, understood as a perfect being, as I described earlier, does not exist. Since God, who is the, or at least an, ultimate reality, is certainly not indifferent, right? Um, God is not indifferent to uh, creatures and uh, the flourishing and languishing of, of rational beings that he himself willed into reality, that he himself um, loved into reality. Hence, it is possible that God doesn't exist. By axiom S5, it follows that God doesn't exist. Thus, SP does not break the symmetry in favor of the original modal ontological argument. So that's kind of, that's my main criticism, or one of, one of my criticisms. Again, I'm going to be leveling three. But this one is just that it doesn't, really re it doesn't remove it doesn't remove the need for well of course there's still the need for symmetry breaker but it, it still preserves symmetry because it kicks the can back a step because atheists also have experiences that either 
or as of God's non-existence or as of something which, if it were true, were would entail God's non-existence and so on. And so the Sankara principle cuts both ways. You're not going to be able to kind of privilege it for the theist side rather than the atheist side. Now, at this point, one might respond by distinguishing between not experiencing God's presence versus experiencing God's absence, or more relevantly, between not experiencing reality's ultimate difference, so ultimate caring for us, versus experiencing reality's ultimate indifference, like it's positively not caring about us. So, for instance, um, w merely from the fact that I don't experience uh, a bunch of uh, virtual particles or a bunch of neutrinos passing through me right now, it doesn't follow that I'm experiencing the absence of neutrinos like crossing through me right now because they are indeed going through me right now. It's just I'm not experiencing them. It's not as though I'm experiencing the absence of them. And so maybe uh, maybe these atheistic experiences, they're just not experiencing God's presence. They're not really experiencing God's absence. Or maybe they're just not experiencing reality's ultimate difference, ultimate care. Maybe they're not actually experiencing reality's ultimate indifference, okay? Now, by experiencing X here, I simply mean having an experience as of X, wherein it appears to one that X is the case. Now, only the latter justifies the reverse modal ontological argument using SP, right? We need to have reality's ultimate indifference because SP concerns um, actually having an experience as of something. And so... We need to have these atheist ex experiences being experiences as of something, not merely being an absence of an experience of God. They need to have a positive experience wherein God absent or a positive experience of something that, if it attained, entailed God's absence. So only this latter justifies the reverse MOA using SP, whereas the former does not. Here's that former not experiencing reality's ultimate difference, and here's that latter experiencing reality's ultimate indifference. And, the objector continues, such atheistic experiences are of the former sort, or at least no reason has been given as to why they're of the latter sort. So, uh, at least plausibly, you know, what these atheists uh, are experiencing, um, or even Christians who have gone through, like, um, spiritual turmoil, what they're experiencing is they're just not having an experience of God's presence. It's not as though they're positively experiencing God's absence, or, you know, uh, put more, more relevantly for our purposes, they're simply not experiencing reality's ultimate difference. Um, it, rather than experiencing reality's ultimate indifference. Now, the principal problem with this response by my lights is that it seems to mischaracterize the phenomenology of at least some such atheistic experiences. I mean, countless deeply religious individuals are actually led to deconversion and profound life changes as a result of such atheistic experiences. And it seems implausible that the mere non-experience of God or of reality's, reality's difference could, inge could engender such radical changes. Um, they seem to have positive experiences here. It's not as though they're like non-experiences or absences of experiences. They seem to have some kind of positive character to them. Moreover, the phenomenological reports of such seemingly honest people should be treated as innocent until proven guilty. After all, that's what Proust himself is relying on in his mystical symmetry breaker. And their phenomenological reports are often cast in strikingly positive terms, a poignant, nearly inexpressible feeling or sense or awareness of the uncaring callousness of nature. I mean, I myself have had similar experiences when reading about horrendous evils. Uh, in my devil's advocate debate with Randall Rouser, he did a, a nice job. And I mean, he was he went into a lot of detail about some really horrendous evils. And uh, you could tell if you watch the video and you look at my facial expressions that I was I was quite disturbed by them. Um, and, you know, if you like read accounts of the Holocaust and uh, what the doctors and, you know, Joseph Mengele and all these other people did to them. If you read accounts of certain tsunamis that have come in and trapped people and innocent uh, civilians and, and children and, and animals uh, under rubble and they, they stay there to, to starve and die of um, uh, lacking food and water and so on. Like when I read about these horrendous evils, I'm sometimes overwhelmed by a profound and distinctive sense of the intrinsic impermissibility of anyone allowing such evils to mm -hmm. transpire. And phenomenologically speaking, these palpable experiences don't seem to be mere non-experiences of the permissibility of such evils. Rather, they seem to be positive experiences, positive senses of the intrinsic impermissibility of anybody allowing such evils to transpire. Again, I'm not using this as an argument for God's existence. I'm showing that Proust's some our principle doesn't distinctively favor the, the modal ontological argument over the reverse modal ontological argument because you have the experiences on both sides, both the theist side and the atheist side. Um, and just this, oh yeah, I put that footnote down here, the, the devil's advocate debate. And here, here's the timestamp, 3641 to 3941. Um, and like, this is a serious trigger warning for people who um, are sensitive to 
you know, talking about rape and other, other things like that. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so overall then Proust's symmetry breaker by my lights does not succeed. Um, that's, that's my first criticism. And I think that by itself is, is a successful response by my lights. And so I'm, I'm going to turn next to counter examples from the phenomenology of mystical experience. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're close to the end. We're, we're close to done. Um, I'm going to let you say one thing because, uh, I know I told you that about this, but, um, one of my friends is, is coming over later tonight and he texted me. So I'm just going to text him while you kind of, uh, talk to the audience for just maybe 20 seconds or something. Um, the big thing I wanted to bring up is, especially with those particularly horrendous evils. I mean, this is where I think, um, at least, at least I want to give an example to anybody that wants to be one of the, like a Christian apologist, right? This is one of those times where I'm going to just be straight up and honest and say arguments from particularly horrendous evils are the things that keep me up at night. Mm -hmm. Like when somebody says like, what kind of argument um, is scary for you? What kind of argument do you just not know how to respond to? It's those. Um, it's they're so difficult. Um, and I, yeah, to this day, I still don't necessarily know the best response to them. Um, but yeah, that debate though was actually really fun to watch still too. Yeah. I mean, Randall Rouser is a really good eighth. <laughs> <Yeah. idiot. laughs> I actually have, I actually have a debate coming up with a friend of mine who's, who's an atheist and we're doing a devil's advocate advocate debate too. So I'm pretty pumped for that. Nice. That's awesome. Okay. I just texted him. Um, and I might have to pause one more time at some point here. So when I hear him, we hear back from him, but thank no you problem. for, uh, for, uh, you know, doing your little show for the audience. I, I was, I was hoping, you know, you might like start to get up and like dancing and something, but no, um, I'm a little right. too, I mean, I'm a little too shy for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's move on to counter examples. So um, I do think that there are plausibly counterexamples to SP. Now, Proust appeals to SP in one purported element of mystical experience, namely the experience as of a maximally great being, to justify the possibility of a maximally great being. But Proust seems to ignore other elements of mystical experience that are thoroughly inimical to his project of vindicating the modal ontological argument. In particular, I propose that mystical experiences of double inclusion and union without distinction serve as counterexamples to Proust's symmetry breaker. The former seems to entail the falsity of SP, while the latter, when combined with the truth of SP, entails the possible non-existence, and hence non-existence, given S5, of the traditional monotheistic god. And I'll explain what these are. So let's take double inclusion first. In some mystical experiences, God is felt to surround the agent, the agent soul, so that this is using kind of terminology and concepts from Teresa of Avila. Um, she was a mystic in, I don't remember what century, um, but it was, a, a some hundred years ago, <laughs> hundreds of years ago. I don't specifically remember. Um, yeah, I'm not even going to try to guess. Uh, but yeah, she's a, a Catholic mystic. She had lots of mystical experiences of God and she actually had, she's written, she wrote extensively on them and she is so good at describing their phenomenological character. She gives criteria for distinguishing between vertical ones and non-vertical ones. It's really interesting. Um, what we had to do was we had to read, um, we had to read a lot of, I think it's called the book of her life. We had to read that in one of Draper's classes that I had with Paul Draper. And we had to talk about the evidential salience or significance of uh, mystical experience. So, um, but yeah, anyway, uh, that, that's where I'm getting a lot of these concepts from, from the phenomenology of religious experience uh, or the phenomenology of mystical experience in particular. So uh, in some mystical experiences, God is felt to surround the agent soul and also to be inside the agent soul, like the mystic's self. So the mystic almost feels like a sponge, that God is uh, like the water that's not only surrounding them, but like pervading them and inside of them, you know, like the water's inside of the sponge. Um, it's like they're like diffused with God. That's how they feel. That's phenomenologically how they feel. Uh, the mystic is like a sponge and God's like the water. The sponge is fully immersed and surrounded in the water, but simultaneously infused with or penetrated by the water. And so it kind of looks like this, the phenomenology of mystical double inclusion. The agent, the, the mystic's self, the agent soul, what, what we call it, um, is such that like they feel as though God is both surrounding them and inside of them. And so the mystic has an experience as of one being surrounded by God and two having God inside of the mystic. Now, if SP is true, a state of affairs involving such double inclusion should be possible. But surely no such state of affairs is possible. So SP is false, in which case Proust's symmetry breaker fails. Why think that no such state of affairs is possible? Well, I mean, one reason is that any such doubly inclusive state of affairs would seem to engender a vicious infinite regress, or at least a problematically infinite number of inclusions. For it's true of God that God surrounds the agent soul. But if God inside the agent soul is God also, well, then it's also true of God inside the agent soul that it surrounds the agent soul. But in that case, the agent soul is included within 
that got inside the agent soul. And thus, a new smallest circle labeled agent soul must be drawn as the innermost concentric circle right there. But since, this, but since it is true of God that God is inside the agent soul, we must draw a further circle and so on ad infinitum. And I say, surely an infinitely inclusive state of affairs like this is, is not possible. That just seems, this kind of vicious regress seems, seems a little absurd. Now, one way out of this predicament is the hold that um, God surrounding the agent soul and God inside the agent soul are not numerically identical and thereby blocking the regress generated by Leibniz's law. Um, perhaps they're different parts or aspects of God. Okay, fair enough. Um, but there are two admittedly not devastating problems with this. I mean, first, it would require someone to deny divine simplicity, something which is not open to proofs because um, he accepts divine simplicity. And second, mystics are quite explicit that it is God that both surrounds them and is inside of them. They don't claim that it's mere like parts of God or aspects of God that serve these different functions. Okay, now let's shift gears to union without distinction. So in mystical experiences, um, the subject object or mystic God structure of the experiences of the experience seems to disappear entirely. This is what mystics themselves report. And this actually led some and I would add many mystics, to claim identity with God, right? So some mystics literally claimed that they were identical with God because they had this subject-object structure of the experience disappear entirely. They don't, in their experience, in their mystical experience, they, they experience a kind of union without any distinction from God. And this is just based on their own phenomenological reports. And I'm, I'm basing this off of um, what Draper, uh, I'm quoting, drawing on some of Draper's work here. Plausibly, then, mystical experiences of union without distinction involve the subject having an experience as of identity with God. And I only need some of them, um, some of them to have that. Per SP, it calls that possibly the mystics are identical with God. And that's flatly incompatible with traditional monotheism, which is the very thing that MOA seeks to demonstrate. Now, why is the possibility of that identity problematic? Well, uh, for one thing, the mystic is presumably by their very nature contingent. Uh, and so if it's possible that the mystic is identical with God, well, then it's possible that God's contingent. Um, but that entails that there is some possible world in which God is a contingent being, in which case there's some possible world wherein God doesn't exist. Uh, and uh, given S5, it's going to follow that possibly God doesn't exist, in which case God doesn't exist per S5. Uh, and again, this is all just, this is all based on SP. Uh, there are also many other problems with such a possibility, but that suffices for now. In summary, I've leveled two counterexamples to Proust's symmetry breaker based on the very on the very mystical phenomenological data on which Proust's case relies. I first argued that double inclusion experiences are incompatible with SP because they they would in, if SP were true, then it would be possible to have this infinitely regressive double inclusion infinitely regressive inclusion state. Uh, and second, I argue that experiences as of union without distinction when conjoined with SP undermine traditional monotheism and the MOA because the mystics seem to have an experience as of being identical with God. And then here is the final criticism on page 13 out of 14. Uh, so yeah, just maybe, um, maybe a few more minutes uh, before we get to some questions. Uh, so yeah, I turn next to my third and final criticism of Proust's symmetry breaker. So this is from Ramification. So as, as we've seen, Proust claims that mystics have experiences as of a maximally great being. That is, it appears or seems to the mystics in experience that the being they experience is maximally great, necessarily existent, morally perfect, omnipotent, and omniscient. But that just seems deeply implausible. By my lights, it is far too ramified. As philosopher Caroline Franks Davis points out, highly, ram highly ramified descriptions may involve highly theory-laden terms or very specific terms. For example, beagle as opposed to dog or animal. Right. So you're just you're basically making quite specific, highly theoretical, intellectualized claims. There are theory laden terms about the thing rather than just kind of saying, oh, I saw a kind of brown figure. Right. Or you could say, oh, I saw a beagle that was one hundred and seventy three point two pounds you know, like that. That's a highly ramified description. And now in our case, Proust imputes to mystical experience experiences very highly ramified descriptions, omnipotent as opposed to very powerful omniscient as opposed to very knowledgeable, morally perfect as opposed to very good and loving, and necessarily existent, which is a modal property, as opposed to just simply existent or modally robust, modally robust, which is just existing in all the nearby possible worlds, not necessarily in all possible worlds. But how could a mystic differentiate phenomenologically between an experience as of a very powerful, very knowledgeable, very good, loving, modally robust being on the one hand, and an experience as of an omnipotent, omniscient, morally perfect, necessary being on the other. I mean, how could a mystic differentiate phenomenologically, right, based on just how things seem to them or appear to them in their experiences? 
how could they distinguish phenomenologically between omniscience and shmomniscience, where, where something is shmomniscient if and only if it knows everything except the spin of an isolated particle? And how could the mystic distinguish between a maximally excellent being and a maximally great being? So a maximally excellent being is an omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect being, but a maximally great being is a maximally excellent being, which is necessarily existent. So you're going to need that kind of maximal greatness for the modal ontological argument because it adds necessary existence. So um, as these rhetorical questions illustrate, uh, I think it's far too hasty to say that mystics actually have experiences as of a maximally great being. No, they, they can't differentiate phenomenologically between much lesser kinds of, but really good beings from a maximally great being. That just, it just seems absurd. Um, but that claim is precisely what Proust needs in conjunction with SP to infer the possibility premise of the modal ontological argument. And so I conclude then that Proust's symmetry breaker fails for a third reason. And so in conclusion, right, I, I've given these, I've focused in particular on Proust's onto mystical symmetry breaker. I've given three reasons to think that it doesn't work. Uh, and I also covered lots of fun preliminaries that I think should give people, you know, pretty good tools for thinking critically about the modal ontological argument and about the fundamental nature of reality. And I just want to say that the modal ontological argument is super fun to think about. Uh, the literature on it is blossoming and there are ingenious moves being made from many and both sides of the debate, both in the theist camp and the atheist camp. And so, um, yeah, anyway, after turning to preliminaries, I, uh, uh, my first criticism was that Proust merely relocates the symmetry since there are atheistic experiences to which SP applies. And second, I argued that Proust's symmetry breaker faces two counterexamples from double inclusion and union without distinction, which are both aspects of phenomenology reported by mystics themselves. And then third and finally, I argued that Proust's argument relies on a mistakenly high degree of ramification. Now, most importantly, of course, I hope to have given you some tools for thinking critically about the modal ontological argument and, of course, about the fundamental nature of reality. I was clicking the wrong button and I was trying to figure out what the heck just happened. That was awesome. Um, that was super cool. So for the audience, anybody, if you guys have questions, now is the time to ask them because uh, you probably have five minutes. Yeah, I've got 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I thought that was really good. Um, I'm per like, I've been trying really hard to see if there's any kind of symmetry breaker that's convincing for me for the modal mm -hmm. ontological argument. It's just been difficult because I want it to work, but <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, it's just one of those things. So, um, people are wondering if they can ask questions unrelated to the argument. You guys can, I guess, if you want. <laughs> Yes, um, they can. Let's see here. Like, here's a question that came up earlier, but it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. Um, let's see. Here we go. Okay. Question. What are some arguments people have given against S5? Oh, that is an excellent question. Um, so... Probably off the top of my head, like these things are super technical and it has to do with the accessibility relation that holds between and across worlds. So S5 takes the accessibility relation, which is like a world is accessible relative to another world. It's like possible relative to it or from the perspective of it. You know, like remember I had that little actuality operator um, and I was talking about worlds being possible relative to the actual world. Um, that's kind of what we were talking about when we we're saying that accessibility relation. So the accessibility relation in S5 modal logic is taken to be an equivalence relation, which just means that it's uh, reflexive, transitive, and symmetrical. Now, uh, some people have leveled criticisms of some of these aspects of the accessibility relation, and thereby, because S5 characteristically takes the accessibility relation to, to, be, to have all three of those, um, that's the way that some people criticize it. Some people um, in particular don't like, they might not like transitivity. So they might think if, um, if another world is possible relative to our world, and then and from the perspective of that world, another world is possible from that world. Well, it doesn't necessarily follow that that third world is possible from the perspective of our world. So just because something is possibly possible, it doesn't just follow that it's possible simpliciter. They might try to say that. Um, uh, or they might take a stab at the symmetry. So just because another world is possible from the perspective of our world, it doesn't follow that our world is possible from the perspective of that world. They might try to uh, uh, criticize that. Anyway, I'm probably just that's probably all I'm going to have to say, be able to say here, um, because they get really technical. Uh, and um, yeah, and it's just I can't explain it without 
<laughs> without you know getting into the weeds. Um, I just advise people to look at uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on um, modal logic. And uh, I believe that Proust and Rasmussen in, in their chapter, they, they deal with a lot of different criticisms that people can level towards it and people have leveled towards it. Um, yeah. And then also, um, what's his name? Tyron Goldschmidt. He has a recent excellent book on ontological arguments. It's, it's in the Cambridge Elements series. So it's really, really small. You can read it really well. It's highly accessible. And he has references in there to um, different different critiques as well. So I picked that up when they were free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so nice about them. Um, okay, I'm going to prioritize this question because this guy watched a recent debate of mine and became convinced of deism instead oh, of theism. Wow. So this is one of the things that holds him back. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there are a bunch <laughs> of different, there are a bunch of different arguments for objective morality. I mean, uh, this almost sounds like cheating, but it, it, I, my shirt actually bears it out. One's modus ponens is another's <laughs> modus trollens. Um, listen, uh, the claim that torturing an infant just for fun or just to hear it squeal the claim that that is wrong is more obvious is more plausible than any highfalutin abstract argument that you might want to give me against moral realism okay so the claim that that is like objectively wrong to go around and torture infants or to gas jews alive or to uh, commit hate crimes things like that like the claim that those things are morally wrong objectively just seems so much more plausible and obvious than any of these highfalutin arguments you'll give me for, against moral realism. And so uh, I think we have really good justification for thinking that objective morality, uh, there is such a thing as objective morality. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a kind of Morian argument uh, because they're, you know, someone might argue against moral realism by doing, a, you know, by giving an argument. And I'm just going to say, hey, well, you can try to modus ponens that. You're going to say, yeah, if your premises are true, then your conclusion follows. Your premises are true, therefore your conclusion follows. I'm going to say, uh, nope, your conclusion is false because it's obvious that torturing babies for fun is morally wrong. And so at least one of your premises is false. Uh, that, I just modus tollens what they wanted to do with modus ponens on. And so that's what my shirt is in reference to. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's one way to go. It's just the kind of uh, self-evidence argument. That it's just like self-evident that, you know, some yeah. of these claims. Um, there what are some other about ones. The M oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, oh, just, just really quickly. I recommend that this person check out. Um, a video on the Analytic Christian channel, um, Jordan Hampton. Yep. Uh, he's one of my friends. Um, check out the video on there. They He had an, a philosopher come on, an ethicist come on, and give a survey of like four or five different arguments okay. from professional philosophers for moral realism. So I recommend checking that out. And of course, check out the alternative case as well. Check out the case. If you want to have an informed view on this, you need to check out uh, what people say against moral realism as well. So check out like Stanford Encyclopedia or entries and uh, Internet Encyclopedia philosophy yep. entries. Yeah, actually, one of the arguments I was just going to ask you about um, from that from that video was the modal ontological argument for moral realism. Ah, uh, dude! Oh my goodness. So I can't say too much about this uh, because okay. I'm I'm writing a paper on that. Uh, oh, so yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm writing a paper on that right now, and I hope to submit it to a journal. So yeah, awesome. Okay, well, can we can skip skip that then. Yeah. um okay so here's a here's another question uh would you say the symmetry breaker used in discussion with alex holds up to affirm the argument um can you give do you think can you can you kind of help clarify oh, this for me yeah, yeah so you the because you were taking the affirmative when you were talking with alex o'connor right Oh, so oh, what's funny is that I was thinking Alex Proust, right? Because I'm, oh. I'm talking, <laughs> I was covering Alex Proust's symmetry breaker here. So that's why I was confused. Oh. Um, so, uh, yeah, so my symmetry breaker, importantly, was defeasible, right? So um, defeasible just means that it gives you some weight of a reason to favor one, one possibility premise over the other. And so, yeah, I do think that my symmetry breaker does, quote unquote, succeed if, in favoring the original modal ontological argument for theism, it succeeds in the sense of it gives at least some weight of a reason to favor the, the theistic possibility premise over the atheistic possibility premise, the possibility premise of the modal ontological argument over the reverse modal ontological argument possibility premise. It gives you some weight of a reason. Now, I'm an agnostic still, of course, because there are thousands and thousands of reasons on both sides, right? So you, you have to do the overall comparative assessment, right? You have to, you have to whenever you're we're doing these things, you have to take a holistic assessment, look at all the available evidence and all the available reasons. And so this is just one chip 
uh, let me move it. It's just one chip uh, that yeah. I think falls on the side of, of theism. Um, and how strong it is depends on a bunch of different factors. Um, but it's at least a chip. And I do think that, yeah, uh, in that sense, it succeeds. Um, but uh, I, I think people can, I th even atheists, I think, can perfectly well recognize that, yeah, this, this is a chip, right? But <laughs> there are like a, a tons of chips on the atheist side and yep. only a few chips on the theist side, so, let's say. So um, I think that both, I think people can rationally still be atheists and even agree with, with what I was saying and still be agnostics and agree with what I'm saying and still be theists and agree with what I'm saying. So, yeah. Yep. Cool. Do you have time for two more? Yeah. Okay, cool. So this one's not in the chat because, and they had to DM me about this, um, but I'm actually really curious about this too. Um, do you know Madoil's uh, Symmetry Breaker? Oh, yeah, Robert Madel or whatever his name is. Yeah. Um, not off the top of my head. When I was, like, back when I was, like, reading um, a lot of Oppie stuff on ontological arguments, I remember covering that one and reading about it. But now uh, <laughs> I forget. Yeah, it's something about uh, how great – what is it? I'm trying to think off the top of my head if I can, like, I mean, it might be it. closer to a kind of Godelian type ontological it's a, argument. It's like um, – a great making property is anything that like a maximally great being has and a lesser making property is anything that it like it doesn't have that's like but if you don't but if you don't know what that is off the top of your head that's totally fine yeah I, i'd have to return to to what i was reading when i was looking uh way back when so no problem. not off the top of my head okay um do you think uh non-existence has an ontology interesting <laughs> um so I take ontology uh, to be the study of what there is. Um, and if that's the case, well, it's hard to see. And when people talk about like their ontological inventory, they mean like what things they countenance in reality, like what they think exists. Um, and so I don't think non-existence exists. Uh, that, seems, that seems pretty uh, clear to me. That, that seems intuitively true. So I don't think it would... It should be either be in our ontological inventory, or I don't think there is such a thing as non-existence. Um, I don't think there are any non-existent objects. There are no non-existent things. And um, I don't think that, uh, yeah, I mean, we can study because we can think about, in some sense, non-existent things like mm -hmm. unicorns and Harry Potter and philosophically informed new atheists and things like that. But um, I, I, don't, I don't see that as having any kind of entailing any robust ontological reality to, to such things so i hope that uh i hope that gives some some answer cool so we got and one more question here it looks like uh, it's a little unrelated but i think it's a good one because it talks about those uh issues about omniscience that you brought up so um does god know that he is omniscient good good question um so yeah if i were a theist i would definitely say that god knows that he is omniscient now I want to actually have Josh Rasmussen on my channel because he has uh, he has really interesting stuff that he says about these Brazilian uh, paradoxes of omniscience, um, and it can potentially be used as uh, an argument for at least certain kinds of open theism. It's really interesting stuff. But uh, anyway, I, I'm going to have to have Josh on my channel to talk about that. My point I'll host is, you too. Oh, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that would be really interesting. Um, but anyway, does God know that he is omniscient? Yeah, uh, if I were a theist, I'd say yes. Um, but, you know, that might get us into some weeds about self-referential knowledge. And, um, mm -hmm. and but, but, you know, there are plausible stuff to say. Uh, it's not as though theists, you know, are utterly unaware of these sorts of things and, and things like that. Yeah. So. Um, do you have time for another one or two? Or what do yeah, you just let, let's do, um, let's do one more. Okay. Um, let's do... This will be interesting. Um, what philosophy of mind do you hold to, if any? Yeah, so I talk about this some in my um, 3K AMA video. Um, you can look at the description to get more specific views. But um, philosophy of mind is just uh, such a complex <laughs> field, man. It's yeah. so insane. Uh, so, uh, I mean, for a variety of reasons, I roughly lean towards some sort of non-physicalist view. Um, I think that, you know, Josh Rasmussen has some really interesting arguments that he's published in like top philosophy journals with like Andrew Bailey and, and others that um, that have to do with like Cantor's theorem and other sorts of things and uh, really interesting stuff that has pushed me to lean towards some form of non-physicalism. But that's a slight leaning 
that's a slight leaning. And I don't know which non-physicalist view is true. Like, I don't have a position there. Like, I think that um, like dual aspect neutral monism is really respect respectable. I think property dualism itself is really respectable. I, I mean, I think epiphenomenalism is hopeless, but, uh, um, but like, you know, and, and I'm a little resistant towards um, substance dualism. I have some worries about uh, the like mind body law- problem. Yeah, like laws of nature, conservation of momentums, you know, and just simplicity and other sorts of things. Uh, I don't want to. Anyway, I, there are some worries, but I still also think that substance dualism is respectable, especially if we have something like mariological nihilism in um, the, the metaphysics of composite objects um, or lack thereof. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the debates there are so complex. And I think that lots of non-physicalist views are respectable. And even physicalist views are respectable, despite the fact that I lean towards non-physicalism. So philosophy of mind is utterly complex. And yep. oh my goodness, it's I don't even know what I hold to. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, it's so I, I don't I don't know how people have unless you're like an expert working in the field, yeah. or like, you know, you, you're like really informed about all the literature. Like, I don't know how people have. Super it seems like people. you would have to have like a relevant PhD in neuroscience <laughs> and philosophy. Yeah, to really have like oh. something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to like, you know, um, you know, kind of see, seal people off from investigating these matters. Um, but uh, for me, at least I can speak personally that it's difficult for me to have a super confident position yeah. in that regard, just because it's so complex. Oh, my yeah. goodness. <laughs> okay. I know you said one more. I said, I know you said one more, but somebody is really wanting me to ask this one. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, wouldn't ontology be a significant symmetry breaker? ontology uh because um, because he's the guy that just asked if non-existence is an ontology and now he's an- answering that in reference to the answer that you gave i think yeah so um ontology right so ontology i take it as like a field right so ontology is a study of what there is i mean i guess someone might be using it differently he might be using it differently but um this is almost like asking, wouldn't metaphysics be a significant symmetry breaker like wouldn't epistemology be a significant symmetry breaker it's, it's hard for me to see um where that symmetry breaker lies but um i'm sure that he's on to something and if he wants to dm me on facebook uh because we we you know we're friends on facebook so he can he can dm me and i can probably i just need some clarification on four yeah which i'll I'll start a group chat i'll start a group chat (laughs) cool uh well i'll let you get to your thing with your friend tonight i really appreciate you coming on man i was super excited about this uh it's an honor to have you on man i'm super excited yeah, Just thank to... you for having me on. I really enjoyed that. And I, I, like I said, I really hope people benefited from this presentation. And it, like, I hope it gives them tools to think critically about these matters. Yep. I hope it clarified a lot of things because I see so much confusion about like logical possibility, metaphysical possibility, epistemic possibility. And uh, confusion makes me sad. So yeah, definitely. Well, I appreciate it, man. I'll, um, I'll close out the stream. And th- again, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I really appreciate you all.